أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم حتى إذا استيأس الرسل وظنوا أنهم قد كذبوا جاءهم نصرنا فنجي من نشاء ولا يرد بأسنا عن القوم المجرمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين اما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته i'm going to try to finish our discussions surrounding ayah number 110 of surah yusuf today um, some of the fundamental points of the ayah that I think are a good, you know, stepping stone to get into the discussions that are a little bit more complicated, uh, we can we completed yesterday, alhamdulillah. And so today we're going to go through. My 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 objective is two things. I'm going to try to go through four opinions and explain each of those four ways of interpreting a phrase in this ayah, and hopefully make sense of that for all of us. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the final phrasing of this ayah and something remarkable that happens inside of that ayah. Uh, that's a reminder of one of the most fundamental teachings of our deen. So we'll start at the top. Hatta uh, idha rusulu until the point came where the messengers almost lost hope. And I'm going to stick to the word almost now because I talked a little bit, quite a bit about um, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah's uh, really elaborate explanation of why that's a convincing argument to say the ayah is saying until the messengers almost lost hope. Because saying the messengers lost hope would not be appropriate to say about messengers. Uh, and he gave several reasons. We've talked about those already. And they were convinced that they were, now there's two translations, they were lied to. One translation, the messengers were convinced that they were lied to. Actually, there's going to be four translations. So I'm going to give you just one for brevity now, but we're going to go to one, two, three, and four on this phrase. So for now, and they were convinced that they were lied to. Ja'ahum nasruna. Our aid came to them, فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءَ And so whoever we want was rescued. وَلَا يُرَدُّ بَأْسُنَا عَنِ الْقَوْمِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And our, our heavy war and our might, the, the, our might of war, uh, will not be turned away from the criminal people. So that last part is actually where some really remarkable things are happening in the ayah, the language of the ayah. But let's first then talk about this, they thought that they were lied to. So... There are two readings of the Qira'at, they're both mutawatira. So in one of them, there are three reciters that, um, that uh, you know, with authentic chains that go back, uh, that recited with ashadda, kudhibu, and there's others that recited with kudhibu. So they're both actually mutawatira, and the one without the shadda is attributed to Ibn Abbas, most famously, radiallahu anhuma, but not only him. And the comment that comes that I referred to yesterday that I read from Ibn Taymiyyah's commentary, there are other variations of that commentary in Sahih al-Bukhari, other places uh, that are attributed to Aisha radiallahu anha, who was more convinced of kuddibu. Something that should be said about that is not all the companions were aware of all of the other variations in reading. So, uh, and because not all of them were full-time you know, ahlu sufa type students of the Prophet So sometimes they had disagreements about what they memorized, and the Prophet ﷺ taught another reading of the ayah also that others had memorized. So, so even if they had a, a clash among themselves about which way to read it, that doesn't mean that one was right and the other was wrong. It's just that there were multiple ways that the Prophet ﷺ himself read it on some occasion. That, and that's why we have qira'at. It is actually a loaded thing. And it is, you know, it, uh, this is something that's part of the richness of the study of the Qur'an, the variant readings in the Qur'an. And inshallah, maybe when I'm done, you know, my laundry list of things that I want to talk about or things that I want to, you know, uh, bring to light. Uh, one of the things I want to do for myself is complete a detailed study of the Qur'an and present as I discover, which I'm doing now with Surah Yusuf. And alhamdulillah, this is the 48th surah that I'm working on. Um, and that'll continue. But after the series is done, what I also hope to do is kind of start a talk show type thing uh, on the Qur'an and take issues like that, that the variant readings or how was the Qur'an compiled or... You know, things said about, you know, contradictions in the Qur'an Or people's questions about the Qur'an Important issues that I think people should know about the Qur'an And invite guests and discuss those kinds of things To raise awareness about issues surrounding the Qur'an So there's two things You're studying Qur'an itself And then you're dealing with things that relate to the Qur'an Right, so those are two separate things And I don't want to be immersed in one and ignore the other So I want to 
kind of separate those two and kind of give each of them their due. But inshallah, ho hopefully we'll put a schedule around that when the time comes. But right now my entire focus is on Surat Yusuf and teaching some of you Arabic. But anyway, uh, coming back to this, there are four ways of interpreting the text, but there are two variant readings. So one is kuddibu with a shadda on the the dal in kuddibu, and the other is without a shadda. So what I'm and for each one of those readings, there's two interpretations. So altogether, four interpretations. Okay. So I'm going to give you the two interpretations of kuddibu. Then I'll give you the two inter interpretations of kuddibu. And as I walk through one, two, three, and four, I'll try to discuss what that implies, what each of them imply. One of them actually I already talked to you about, but it's good to go over it again. So number one. Based on the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, kuddibu, when she was asked, then what does that mean then? In a nutshell, what she said is, here's how you would read the ayah. Then when the messengers lost all hope, implying the messengers almost lost all hope that these people that they're preaching to are not going to listen to them, they're stuck in their ways. And they've only gotten worse. And I talked to you about that yesterday. They, they only got worse in their adversarial, aggressive, ad their standoffish attitude against the messengers. And when things became nearly completely hopeless and became so desperate and difficult, at that point, the, the messengers even started thinking, and lanna can mean two things now, this is important. Lanna can mean to assume something, like al-i'tiqad uh, al-marjuh, meaning more than 50%, when you think something is more than likely, right? Then you can call it lan. But interestingly, lan in Arabic can also mean absolutely convinced. So, depending on the four opinions, some, one of the opinions will say, here lanna means they started assuming or they started entertaining the thought, right? Or the thought started overwhelming them. But that doesn't mean they're convinced, it just means they're having a thought, right? And the other reading will be they're completely convinced. So right now we're in a reading in which we're going to read this as they started thinking or they kind of developed the, the notion, the, the, the thought occurred to them. What thought occurred to them? Annahum qad kuddibu, that the people that they were they were considered or they were believed to be liars even by those who followed them things got so hard for the messengers that they lost hope that people will, the non-believers will stay non-believers and only get worse but they made things so difficult for him and anybody who believed around him that he, they started wondering if the people around them who were told allah's help is near have hope in allah be grateful to allah trust Allah, might start questioning, you kept telling us to trust Allah, things aren't getting any easier. The sky didn't open up and no angelic help arrived. We kept believing in you and we've lost everything and years have gone by, decades have gone by and things have only gotten worse. I don't know if I can keep up with this. So maybe, it, maybe you're not exactly a prophet. And the prophets themselves started feeling, getting the feeling, getting the thought that maybe some of my followers are going to consider me a liar. Even if they're not saying it, the thought is coming in their hearts. Right? So th this, this idea that maybe they're, they're not seeing me the way they used to see me because of how things have become difficult. You see, uh, <laughs> this is a terrible analogy, but I think it gets the point across. It's easy to be the fan of a, of a winning team. Right? If the team says we're going we're gonna to make it to the playoffs and they make it to the playoffs... It's easy to root for them and watch every game and all of it. But when a team starts losing, right? Your team's down by 40 points. They got one minute left in the game. And there's one guy with the giant shahada thing holding it up like, ah, believe. No, you're just fanatical. You start questioning, yeah, maybe they are losers. Maybe there is no magic here. You know? The, the point is, faith can be tested when things become difficult. And for the messengers, it's hard enough to know that they're, the, the people that they're trying to preach to, the people that they're trying to help to connect them to Allah for their own benefit aren't listening to them, but the people that they have benefited, the people that did listen to them are now starting to they're not saying it, but they might be slipping away because kathaba, I translated yesterday kathaba is to call someone a liar but actually tafi'il can do something also, i'tibar also, which means you can consider someone a liar without saying it, and that's also kathaba so ظنوا أنهم كذبوا The messengers started thinking that they are being considered liars. They're, they've been أنهم قد كذبوا That they've already been considered liars even by the So Aisha is implying here in parentheses even by those who had followed them. Even by those who had followed them. So they don't have evidence of this but the thought is occurring things are getting so hard I'm not sure if they want to stay around. 
stick around. You understand? So this is a, um, this is, again, a terrible analogy. But you know, sometimes, not that you guys watch movies because you're so Islamic, you're only on Islamic Facebook. So it's hard to explain this to you, but you know, sometimes in a movie, somebody says, who's with me? Who's going to go into, we're, we're going to lose this battle. We're probably going to get killed, but I'm going alone. And so some guy gets up and says, I'll come with you. And another guy says, I, me too, count me in. And then they all kind of one by one stand up, right? And he says, look, I'm, we're, we're going to get killed. So if you want to walk away, nobody's going to hold it against you. You understand? Like, this is not a winning battle. This is not, and no, we're winning you till the death. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, that's just in the movies. But when things really do get tough and somebody says, I don't think I signed up for this, which is literally what happens in Medina. You see, Medina accepting Islam became a lot easier because you didn't get kicked out of your home as soon as you accepted Islam. You didn't start getting tortured as soon as you accepted Islam. You didn't have to hide yourself as soon as, as, soon as you accepted Islam. You're part of a powerful group in Medina. In fact, those that are the most socially and politically influential. But then when t time for Badr came, wait, I mean, I thought we're with the winning team. We're going to go fight against Quray. I didn't sign up for this. Can we just make peace with them? So we got to fight too? We got to do that? That's not what I signed up for. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ Baqarah says, hypocrites came and said, we're just trying to make peace. Why do you have to cause corruption? لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ they, they say, they say to the believers, why are you causing corruption? Why are you causing, you know, fighting? Don't cause fighting, just let, let's just make peace. And Allah says, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ They're the ones causing corruption. So here, the, 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 the messengers might start thinking, maybe hypocrisy, because when does hypocrisy, the disease of hypocrisy, when does it get born? What's the environment in which hypocrisy is born? Difficult circumstances. Because a faith is easy to hold on to in easy circumstances, and I'm not so sure if I want to hold on to this faith. When does someone start thinking that way? When difficult circumstances come, right? So because they are in such difficult circumstances, they start thinking that their messengers might even leave them be. Now let's look at the, the latter part. Ja'ahum nasruna. At that moment, our aid came to them. That, just as the messengers were even losing confidence that their own wouldn't even follow them. In that moment, then our aid came to them. Because they felt so powerless, I don't know what else I can do as a human being with this message, which only brings about trouble, to keep you with me. I don't know what else I can do. I'm completely helpless at this stage. And it is in that moment when basically any worse than that, it's completely hopeless. So if hopelessness was at level zero, they've reached, they've reached from 100, they've reached to one. One more degree and now there's, there's a state of hopelessness. And right before it touches to the place where human beings can't bear anymore, that's when Allah sends His help. Our aid came to them. And Nasr in Arabic is used not just for aid or help, it's used for help against an enemy. Actually, one of the ways you can describe the word Nasr in Arabic would be, in modern words, military aid. Military aid would be Nasr. He uses the word in battles like, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ Right? وَأَنْتُمْ uh, أَذِلَّةً and, and you know, Nasr for example, وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ In Surah bin Ali Imran describing Uhud, the battle of Uhud. وَمَنْ نَصْرُ مِنْ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Finally, when the aid came and thousands of legions came and conquered Makkah, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Same word. So here, جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا Our aid came to them. Our aid came to them in that final moment when things were the worst they could be. And by the way, the, the most difficult hardship being described, it's so incredible if you contemplate this, the most difficult hardship being described for the messengers is not what's happening on the outside. It's what's happening inside their hearts. The fact that they're losing hope that these people won't believe is the, the hardest thing for them. The fact that they're even starting to think that their old followers will you know, consider them liars now. Because no help came from Allah. That's the hardest thing for a messenger. No physical difficulty compares to that. And that's when Allah's aid came. جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا So it came against the enemy. فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءُ then whoever, this is, I'm going to translate it literally now, we rescued whoever we want. Let me translate that. Well, no, sorry, I mistranslated. Whoever we want was rescued. That's the right translation. 
then whoever we want was rescued. But I was expecting him to say whoever we wanted was rescued. Because he's talking about history, right? Messengers, they lost hope. That's the past. But he said, now listen, part of it's past, part of it's present. He says, whoever we want, present tense, was rescued. Past tense. This is, in Balagha, they call this idmaj, fusion. Ibn Ashur correctly points this out. I had a feeling this was going on. I didn't say nothing. And then Suhaib said, well, Ibn Ashur said something interesting about this. I was like, let me guess, let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. I didn't say it. And he read it. I was like, yep, that's what it was. Because this concept is, when you fuse past and present together, you're fusing timelines. You're superimposing timelines, right? And what does that do? That means... This is a, a fused way of saying we rescued whoever we wanted and we and, and or whoever we wanted was rescued and whoever we want until today will still get rescued. But even the so not, so what has Allah done? He's, he was talking about prophets of previous eras, right? But then he took that comment about history and just by use of the word nasha. He pulled it out of history and made it into a timeless statement about his rescue. And whoever we want, then gets rescued. But it still begs the question, and we're still on reading number one, this will make reading number two, three, and four easier, because we'll have dealt with this part, right? It still begs the question, well, rescued, why, why the word rescued? Nujia, Mannasha. Well, because previously, they lost, the messengers lost hope, Right? Well, what does that mean? That means that most people aren't going to believe in them. So there's the disbelievers that are implied, they're present in the Saya. Right? They're, they're pre- and then their own followers might not be following them anymore. So the messengers have their own assumption about how no, basically nobody's left. Right? There's no one left. But then Allah says, whoever we want was rescued. Which is amazing. Uh, let me tell you why it's amazing. I hope I can be clear about this. Imagine the messengers are preaching to a nation, a village, a messenger is preaching, preaching to a village, talking to everybody in the village, and nobody's listening to him. Can the messenger ever know what's going on inside every single heart? No. Is it possible that someone's in that village who heard him and actually took what he was saying to heart? but was too scared to say anything and kept faith inside their heart and never told the messenger? Is that possible? Is it possible that in the dark of the night they're praying to God to make a way out for them and if their family finds out, they'll kill them so they're too scared to come out and say it. But they are there and you just don't know about them? And the messenger, what he sees are people who are adamantly defiant against him, making fun of him, humiliating him, being aggressive towards him. And that starts forming his opinion of all the people in the village and he starts losing nearly all hope that none of them are going to believe. And then he starts thinking, if none of them are going to believe, the few that I have, I'm also noticing some things, maybe that means they're also walking away from me, right? And it may be true that some of his own followers may also have the seeds of hypocrisy inside. Is that possible? So a messenger doesn't know what's going on inside the heart of a non-believer. And a messenger doesn't even know what's going on inside the heart of a believer. Isn't that true? Look at the next phrase. After they nearly lost all hope, and they thought that they have been lied against, they've been considered liars. Our aid came to them. So the first part is our aid came to them. Fine. That means Allah gave them victory. That covers that part. But then he says, and whoever we wanted was rescued. Allah didn't say, and mes- the messenger and those who followed, the messengers and those who followed them were rescued. He said, whoever we wanted was rescued because Allah is telling us there are people even the messenger didn't know about that were rescued. And there were people that the messengers thought were should be rescued that didn't deserve to be rescued. They were not, they were people assumed to be non-believers that turned out to be believers. And there were people that were considered believers that turned out to be hypocrites and didn't deserve rescue. So who knows in the end who will be saved and who won't be saved? Allah alone. So whoever we wanted was rescued. It's amazing. Why is this amazing? Because these are the places in the Quran where Allah draws a line between Himself and messengers. Yes, they represent His message. But they don't have the capacity to judge the way Allah judges. Because at the end of the day, 
they're still human. They can lose hope and they can have thoughts, not knowledge, about what people really have in their hearts. They can have optimism or pessimism, but only Allah will know. So he, at the end, he kind of draws this line and says, the messengers have their limits, they reach their limit, but my limit and my judgment is way beyond theirs. Whoever we want was rescued. And it's like even making a comment about the Prophet's time. Think about this. This is in Mecca. This, is, this ayah is coming in Mecca. And there are some people who hate Islam right now. Hate it. And within a decade from now, they're going to be some of the biggest assets to Islam. Who knows that? Only Allah. And, who, and the Prophet ﷺ is about to leave Mecca hopeless. Can't do anything else. I have to leave this place now. Right? Almost all hope is lost. And then when he comes back in Hudaybiyah, Hudaybiyah means three wars have happened. Three, Badr has happened, Uhud has happened, Ahzab has happened. Three wars have been waged by Mecca against the Prophet. And then he comes back to Hudaybiyah. And they're about to go and there's almost a war that's going to break out inside of Mecca. And what does Allah say? لَوْلَا رِجَالٌ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَنِسَاءٌ مُؤْمِنَاتٌ لَمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Had it not been for believing men and women that are inside Mecca that you don't even know about. Oh, there are still people inside Mecca. After the years of preaching that you never knew. After living in Medina that you never knew. None of you know them. I know them as believers. And they're hiding their faith inside Mecca. And that's why I didn't let war break out at Hudaybiyah, Allah says. Because you would have trampled all over them, not even knowing they're believers. Poof. For Nujiya man nasha, whoever we wanted was rescued. Allah. What an incredible statement. And then, now look at the last part of the statement. وَلَا يُرَدُّ بَأْسُنَا عَنِ الْقَوْمِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And our war, بأس Arabic, بأس in Arabic actually means toughness and harshness. Toughness and difficulty. So a person who's مُبْتَئِس, like Yusuf said to his brother, Bin Yamin, when he finally found him, لا تبتئس بما كانوا يعملون. Don't feel harsh inside. And don't feel the difficulty over what they've been doing to you. Remember that? تبتئس. Then, you know, عذاب uh, بئيس, a punishment that's full of harshness and difficulty. And from the words harshness and difficulty, this, start getting, this word started getting used for war, which brings about the worst kind of harshness and difficulty. So the word is, it's, it's one of the words in Arabic for war. But not just war, because of the attributes of harshness and difficulty, this word started getting used for things that can bring about harshness and difficulty, meaning things that can be used for war. So if a nation is capable of great war making, they can wreck another nation, they're called uli ba'sin shadid. Or nahnu ulu ba'sin shadid. We are possessors of great ba's, meaning we have the capability to wreak havoc on our enemy. We can bring it to our enemy when they have heavy artillery and military might that can cause enormous destruction, they are people of Ba's. They are people of Ba's. Allah says about iron that He sends down from the sky, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ We sent down iron, it has, it has intense Ba's, meaning capacity for destruction. It has capacity to wage great war. That, that metal, that, that element, has capacity to, to wage great war. That's what Allah says about the word Hadid, the word iron, right? Now come to this ayah. He says, وَلَا يُرَدُّ بَأْسُنَا Our بَأْس Allah says about Himself, our war and our capacity of war, our artillery, our overwhelming military might shall not be turned away عَنِ الْقَوْمِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ from the criminal people, from the criminal nation. What in the world does that mean? That means, first He said we rescue, whoever we want was rescued, right? You would think when Allah's punishment comes, like a flood, even good people are going to drown. Everybody's going to get killed. Right? What does Allah do in this ayah? First He says, messengers became hopeless that everybody's a disbeliever. Right? Then He says, no, even messengers didn't know. I knew some of them are believers. And so what does He say? Whoever we want was rescued. So who's left? Only criminals. 100% criminals. In, in the sight of Allah. And so when his war comes, when his destruction comes, in the times of messengers, not one innocent soul is executed. It's not, oh, I'm going to smite all of them, I'm going to wreak havoc on all of them, and the good, the bad among them, everybody will die. No, it's not like that. Only criminal people. And our war will not be turned back. And our, our, our military might, and its full brunt of its force, will not be turned back except from, from the criminal people. It's amazing. There's not a blanket punishment. Sorry, you got swept up. 
Shouldn't have been there. Friendly fire, I suppose. No. Collateral damage. No collateral damage. Then it's interesting that Allah didn't just say anil mujrimin from criminals. He said anil qawmil mujrimin from the criminal people. Qawm is the mawsuf, al mujrimin is the sifa. Grammar students, four properties match. Jar majrur, anil qawmil mujrimin. Why even the word qawm? Because messengers came to their own qawm, right? Their own people. So how do you define a nation? People that are the same ethnicity, the same language, the same region, the same border, the same tribe. That's how you define a qawm. But Allah, once the messengers come, redefines qawm. Qawm of believers, qawm of criminals. It's like now, the, now a new border has been drawn. And literally, when you have a border, nations are separated, right? So right before destruction comes, what does Allah do? Allah separates believers and prophets from the nation that's about to be destroyed. Physically, He separates them because they're about to get wrecked. Right? Take you and your family and go. إِنَّهُمْ جُنْدُمْ مُغْرَقُونَ They're an army that's about to be drowned. Or their punishment is coming the next day. Messengers will come and tell a, tell a messenger to leave town with his people. Right? Over and over again. Because they're a different qawm now. They're al qawm al-mujrimeen and Allah's verdict against them will not be turned away. I'm reminded of the punishment that came to the people of Lut. And the way Allah described it, مُسَوَّمَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ لِلْمُسْرِفِينَ لِنُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهِمْ حِجَارَةً مِنْ تِينَ Allah said He sent stones from the sky to those people. And every stone was musawwama. It's like it had the person it's supposed to kill, their name branded on it. Like, you know, like in, again, you don't watch movies or nothing, but this bullet's got your name on it. That sniper fire. Like which, which stone was supposed to hit which person by brand? It was branded from the sky, straight shot. Allah says here, our, our, our war will not be turned away from the criminal people. It's interesting that it comes in Surah Yusuf though. Because in Surah Yusuf, we learned about some criminals. We learned about the minister's wife. She was a criminal. We learned about Yusuf's brothers, and they were criminals. But did they redeem themselves? Yeah. So that phrase, whoever we want was rescued. Because when you read the story, you're hopeless with those people. Those people look like a lost cause. From the human perspective, they are a lost cause. It looks like it. But they didn't suffer consequences in the end. They had a chance to redeem themselves because Allah knows who to redeem. Our perception can be false. And that's an incredible thing. And what's going to happen in the Prophet's life? There are going to be some people that are absolutely the worst enemies of Islam. Khalid ibn Walid is actually pivotal in what almost killed the Prophet in Uhud. Khalid ibn Walid. Hero of Islam. People name their kids Khalid. My son's name is Khalid. Someone who almost caused the murder of our messengers. <laughs> and we name our children after them. Why? Because they turned around. فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءَ Whoever we want was rescued. That was reading number one. We'll move on to reading number two. They were... So then, then the pronouns, وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِّبُوا means this time ظنوا doesn't mean they thought remember it means two things to be convinced also so this time the reading will be until the messengers lost all hope nearly lost all hope and they were convinced that they will now be considered liars absolutely or they've already been considered liars it's a done deal these people are not going to change they're completely a gone cause they're completely a gone cause and what Imam Razi implies from that is in the first part they lost hope which is phase one, they lost hope. And then he describes in the next phrase, why did they lose hope? They lost, when they lost hope, they saw that these people are no longer, they saw all the signs that are, everything Allah had to show them, Allah showed them, the miracles have been shown, and they've turned away even more. Nothing else can happen after Allah shows miracles. So they've gone to the farthest end. So even the messengers gave up on them, on those people, and were convinced now that they're not going to be called anything but liars by these people. And when that happens, basically, it is the time when, it's, even though it hasn't been stated explicitly in this ayah, it's in other places, when a messenger turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, these people have disbelieved. When a messenger simply turns to Allah and says, these are disbelieving people, he needs to say no more. <laughs> because when Nuh salam says in the beginning, إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا فَلَمْ يَزِلْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا I called my people night and day. 
they nothing changed. Every time they heard my call, the only thing that happened more is they ran away more. لم يزدهم دعائي إلا فرارا. وكلما دعوته دعوتهم لتغفر لهم جعلوا أصابعهم في أذانهم. Every time I called them so that you could forgive them, they stuck their fingers in their ears. وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ They pulled on their clothes like I'm someone disgusting. Like I'm, they're gonna get dirty by my touch or by my presence. وَأَصَرُّوا And they became adamant. وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا And they showed the worst kind of arrogance. ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعُوتُهُمْ جِهَارًا Then I called them during the day, openly. ثُمَّ أَعْلَنْتُ لَهُمْ Then I made public announcements to them over and over again. وَأَصَرْتُ لَهُمْ بِسَرًا And I was insistent with them. Well, listen, but by the end, he still didn't call them disbelievers, right? He said, I call my people day and night. By the end of that surah, called them kuffar. He actually had it. Right? He convinced, he was convinced that he's now being called a liar. Generations of them have passed. It's done. It's too late. So what does he say? Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al Ya Allah, don't leave any one of them. Don't spare any one of them. This is some heavy dua with Nuh salam. That's a harsh one. It's even hard to read that a messenger would say those words. Messengers are like the epitome of love and care for their people, right? And he, what brought him to that point? What is it, how, how much did they torture him to get him to that point where he can say, Ya Allah, leave not a home of these people surviving. Oof. <laughs> So he says this, or the, the, the prophets, when they're convinced that they've been called liars, then Allah says, yeah, well my, when my messengers give up like that, or have reached that stage, that means that it's time for my aid to come. No, I'm here now. Ja'ahum nasruna. So, and the rest of the ayah already explained. So that's reading number two. Reading number three. So the, in summary, reading number one was that the, they lost hope in the disbelievers, and they even started questioning that believers might leave. Or might, cons- might have considered them liars. Second one, that the messengers were convinced, completely convinced, that they are not going to be believed in now. Like everybody's just given up on them. The disbelievers exclusively. Now we're going to look at the three, two readings of Kudibu. Kudibu, without the Shadda, okay? So here, Wadhanu, they, they thought, or they assumed, will be given to the, dis- the disbelieving nation. So let me... Say it without the pronouns, so you can see what that means. Okay, so even though the tr- the literal text is with pronouns, I'll replace the pronouns with nouns, so it makes easier sense to you to see what the mufassirun are saying. We can interpret this ayah as until the point where messengers almost lost all hope. That's been said, and their people assumed, not the messengers, but their people assumed that they have been lied to. Their people assumed that they have been lied to. Now think about that. Nuh's people assumed that they have been lied to. Lied to by who? Nuh, right? Lied to about what? This is not just, oh, lied about Allah, lied about being a messenger. No, because as they became more and more adamant, the messenger was saying, you have become so much worse than we started. Allah's punishment will come. I don't want it to come to you. Inni akhafu alaykum adaba yawmin azim. I fear the coming of a great day, punishment of a great day coming towards you. Yeah, yeah. They were convinced that they're being lied to about a coming what? Punishment. No, no, bring it. Oh, punishment? Why don't, why don't you just bring it? Let's see it. Don't sing it, bring it. Let's have it. You keep talking about it. I'm tired of hearing about it. It's been 10 years, 20 years. My grandkids used to hear this from you, Nuh. Let's have it already. They became adamant. And they were so convinced. And they assumed that those calls for saving yourself, man, this guy's been saying 800 years, 700 years, 200 years, that there's a punishment coming. Mm Mm-hmm. Punishment. Yeah. Please. 900 years. 950 years. That was the wrong year to say that. Because when it comes, it won't be turned back, right? So they assumed that they have been lied to by the messengers, meaning they didn't take the warnings seriously. What we can learn from that is, messengers almost lost hope because 
people around them just wouldn't take their warning seriously. And you know what? What we learn from that is in the nature of da'wah, when you love someone, you care about someone, you feel like you want to warn them, and then the warnings become a joke. And that makes you really hopeless, that they don't take the warning seriously, right? And when you feel that pain, you feel a connection to the prophets who tried to warn the people that they loved, but when they didn't hear, when they didn't hear that warning as a warning, they took it as a joke, that this is just a lie, you're just duped, you're just backwards, you're not modernized enough, you need to get with the times, you're so traditional, whatever, you're superstitious, none of this is real, you're, this is just something you, you follow this religion to feel good about yourself, and it really has no true basis. When they said things like that, it hurt. It hurt you. But they were convinced, or they were, they were pretty confident that you're, you have no backing. So, وَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ كُذِبُوا Okay? Then the other reading of this is slightly, it's not a, it's, it, this wouldn't be the fourth reading, it should also be part of the third reading, that the, the nation believed that the prophets were lied to. Or actually even the followers might have believed that the prophets were lied to, meaning this poor guy's gone insane. He just taught, he rambles. You know, he's, he's been lied to by his own self, or he's been lied to by some demons, or he's been lied to by some people that have just duped him, turned him into a cult trying to make him start a cult. He's just a victim of brainwashing. That's why he talks about these things. So this is the people dismissing them. And when people were completely ready to dismiss them, that's when Allah's aid came and they realized the, the error in their ways. But it's too late by then. Then the hardest one. So I left a lot, the hardest one for last. So you've done one, two, three, and now the fourth one. So let me spell it out for you first. The prophets believed that they were lied to. This has also been a classical interpretation. Actually going back to Ibn Abbas. The prophets believed that they were lied to. Imam Razi read this and says, La uh, yunasibu al-anbiya. This, this statement cannot be appropriate to say about prophets. Because when you say things became so hopeless, almost lost all hope, and they started thinking that they've been lied to, somebody might, you might assume from that, they started thinking they've been lied to by who? Allah? Maybe I'm not really a prophet? Maybe this was all in my head? Maybe Allah deceived me? Maybe it wasn't Allah at all? That's the, the fourth, we have to unpack that. How do we understand that fourth reading of the ayah that even the messenger started thinking that they have been lied to? There are lots of examples. This is where you have to have a, a sense of nuance and appreciation of how Allah describes prophets and their stories and how everything is elaborated in the Qur'an so you can put together these things properly in their place. One well, person who did a brilliant job of explaining this is Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and Imam al-Alusi in, in recent times actually took from that and described it even further. And I think that deserves attention. So let's look at that carefully. فَسَمَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَا التَّفَاوُتَ بَيْنَ الْإِيمَانِ وَالْإِطْمِنَانِ شَكًّا Let me take a step back and really help you process this properly. We have faith. We have faith. We believe in Allah. In fact, we have faith up here. We're convinced that Quran is the word of Allah. We're convinced that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. We're convinced there's a day coming called the day of judgment. We're convinced of, of resurrection. We're convinced of one supreme being, Allah, who has no partner. We're convinced of these things, yes? We're convinced of the existence of angels on our shoulders. We're convinced of all of this. We believe all of these things to be true. But that is concepts, ideas, truths that we have come to accept in our minds. Which is different from what you can feel inside your heart. You can believe in Allah and still feel afraid. And you'll have to remind yourself at certain situations, there's no need to fear, I need to fear only Allah. Even though all along, while you were feeling fear, your mind already knew that the only one to fear is Allah, but the heart lets go of that sometimes. The heart can be in different states, while the mind is constant. If I woke you up at 2 in the morning and said, who's your, who's your God? You say, Allah, now let me go to sleep. You're, it's not because you were asleep, you forgot. Or you're at the mall that you forgot. Or you're in the middle of a class, you forgot. You know, or you're busy with something, you, you don't forget who your rub is, what your book is, you don't forget that. But does your heart lose sight of that sometimes? Yes. Ibrahim salam asked Allah, how do you give life to the dead? Yeah? Allah asked him, why don't you, don't you believe? 
Of course Ibrahim believes. Ibrahim is the one who jumped into a fire and it didn't burn. <laughs> Ibrahim is the one who this to his son. Right? And it doesn't, the knife refuses to cut. Ibrahim is the one who left his family in the middle of a desert, death, and Allah produced life. Yes or no? Over and over again, who has seen that Allah gives life out of death? Ibrahim. And at the end of all of that, he turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, could you show me how do you, how do you give life to the dead? And Allah says, You haven't believed? You haven't had enough demonstrations? If anybody's convinced of Allah produces life after death, or Allah controls life and death, it's who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's the living case study. <laughs> Isn't he? What does he say? He says, Bala, of course. Of course. I just want to calm my heart. He says, in order to calm my heart. You know how you can understand that answer? I completely believe it up here. I completely believe it up here. I want to feel something down here more than what I already feel. I need to feel something here. You understand? And that state between these two, there's a, this is different, this is different. You understand? The Prophet ﷺ in one hadith, which people don't properly understand, he said, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِالشَّكِّ مِنْ Ibrahim." We are more worthy of having doubts than Ibrahim was when he said, how do you give life to the dead? How do you understand that? Here's how you understand that. The Prophet ﷺ named the state between having faith up here and the, the heart being completely calm, the heart feeling at ease, the state between those two can be called doubt. That doesn't mean you doubt up here. It doesn't mean that the doubts of, of truth inside of, your, in, inside of your mind. None of the beliefs and the ideas are shaken. But your heart needs a calmness. And when the heart is not at ease, he, he even called that shak. Now, coming to this ayah, they started thinking that they have been what? Lied to. They never once thought that Allah would lie to them. They never once thought Allah would lie to them. But you know what this is? Let me tell you. The Prophet ﷺ was given a dream that he's going to go make hajj. You know that? He, said, he got up and he told everybody, I saw a dream. Okay, let's go. The messenger sees a dream, it's revelation. What else could it be? So we all pack up and go. Almost get killed multiple times on the way. Leave our life savings behind. Show up all the way to Hudaybiyah. Now we're at Hudaybiyah, only a few miles from Makkah now. And Makkah says, you can't come. You can't come. Sign a treaty that you won't do Hajj this year, you'll come back next year. Uh, okay, let's sign. The Prophet says, sign it. Let's do it. Everybody in the crowd is like, uh, but you saw a dream. That's why we're here, right? Umar bin al-Khattab who is the pinnacle of faith, turns to the Prophet ﷺ and says, didn't you see a dream that we'll make Hajj this year? Aren't we the people on the truth? Aren't you Allah's Prophet? Aren't you Allah's Prophet? Allah. <laughs> this is who asks who? Abu Umar bin al-Khattab asks Rasulullah ﷺ. And you know usually when Umar asks something like that, or if he does get step out a little bit, you know who puts him in place? Abu Bakr immediately. But guess what? Abu Bakr is quiet too. For the first time. For the first time. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Yes, I did say I did see a dream. And he said, Didn't you see a dream that we're gonna make Hajj this year? He said, No, I saw a dream that we'll make Hajj. I never said this year. I never said what? This year. Everybody else might even start getting the thought that the Prophet has been lied to or that they have been lied to by the Prophet, Ma'adullah. But the Prophet ﷺ knows, you know what? My calculations lied to me. I was lied to by my assumption. My assumption that I will make Hajj, is that Allah means this year. You understand? Allah will say He'll send His help. Will Allah necessarily reveal the timetable for that help? No. The nature of that help? No. Right? Well, we're only human. When he sees a dream, what's his assumption? He means what? This year. 
sees a dream, you act on it right away, right? So he acts on it right away. Think about Yusuf alayhi salam and his dream that his brothers are going to do sajda. They're going to be humbled before him. When he's a slave getting beat up in the marketplace, being sold in the marketplace like a goat, do you think he feels like his dream is coming true? You think when he's serving inside an Egyptian minister's house, he, th- feel like, he feels like his dream is coming true? You think when he's rotting inside a, inside a jail cell, he, f- he feels like his dream is coming true? There's a promise from Allah. But the thought might be, when is it going to come? Right? And you start, your thoughts start creating your own timetable. Maybe it's going to happen this way. But it doesn't turn out that way. Maybe it's going to happen that way, and it doesn't turn out that way. And it doesn't turn out that way. So even the messengers at some point started thinking that they have been lied to. Lied to by what? Their own, their own hopes. That this is how the help of Allah will come. Or this is when the help of Allah will come. Not that Allah lied to them. But their, their hopes have lied to them of how Allah's help will be man- executed. And that's pretty devastating too. I know Allah didn't lie, but I was... Re- I, I, Allah never lied to me, but I was really hoping the help would come right now. That false assumption lied to me. That, assu- that, that, that faith that I developed, that it will come in this way and at this hour, will, has lied to me. And nahum kudhibu. That they, they were lied to. Even the messenger started losing. And when you do that, even though I, have, I still have faith in Allah's promise, it's been dented. I feel hurt. It didn't happen. I was really putting all my hope in it, right? And so when that happens, that's when Allah sends His help. Ja'ahum nasruna. It's as if Allah ex- allows His messengers to experience the pain of disappointment. And then says, now I'll let you taste the sweetness of relief. But the sweetness of relief just wouldn't taste as sweet if you didn't experience the pain of disappointment first. You need to develop the appetite for relief. Man, tell somebody who's been lying in a hospital bed for two years, when they walk out and breathe fresh air for the first time, the joy of walking that they feel and the annoyance you feel that you have to walk all the way to the trash deposit to throw the trash out. It's still the same act of walking, but they were relieved from something, and that's the most joyous experience of their life, just walking. Just walking. Somebody who's colorblind, you ever see those? People who are colorblind, and they develop special glasses for them, they can see color for the first time. You being able to see, I don't want to wake up, I'm still sleeping. They see for the first time, they're overwhelmed with joy. Because when you're deprived of something, and then Allah gives it to you, then the joy is over. Then you appreciate the priceless gift that it was. Allah's help comes, but He wants you to taste the sweetness of what it is. So and so he, so he then in this last reading, He allows His messengers to taste such deep disappointment, where even they start thinking that they've been lied to by on their own. And let me read this to you now. Well. Uh, فَسَمَّ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم التفاوت بين الإيمان والإطمئنان شكاً بإحياء الموتى The Prophet ﷺ named that state between we, I know I believe in my head but the calmness I should the, the, the relaxation I should feel in my heart because of my faith sometimes I don't feel that relaxation that state can be a doubt too بإحياء الموتى like giving life to the dead in the story of Ibrahim ﷺ وعلى هذا يقال and based on this exact principle it can be said الْوَعْدُ بِالنَّصْرِ فِي الدُّنْيَا لِشَخْصٍ قَدْ يَكُونُ الشَّخْصِ مُؤْمِنًا بِإِنْجَازِهِ That the promise that aid from Allah is coming in this life, made to a person. It could be that the person believes that this help will come. وَلَكِنْ قَدْ يَطَّلِبُ قَلْبُهُ فِيهِ But his heart is still disturbed because it hasn't come yet. فَلَا يَطْمَئِنُّ And the heart is not calm. It's not, it's not tranquil. فَيَكُونُ فَوَاتُ الْإِطْمِئِنَانِ ظَنًّا then this lack of calmness can start becoming a thought, annahu kudib, that his heart might feel that it's not gonna happen. Ya Allah, I know in my brain it's gonna happen, but I feel like it's not. You, you understand the difference? I know your promise is true, but I feel like, why do I feel like it's not gonna happen? Why do I feel hopeless? Why am I getting, starting to get that feeling? فَشَكُّ وَظَنُّ أَنَّهُ كَذِبٌ مِنْ بَابٍ وَاحِدٍ that, that doubt even is actually can, can be considered a kadhib. And that's what this last reading is. أَنَّهُمْ كُذِبُوا فَإِنَّهُمْ Now listen to this. فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا بُدَّ أَنْ يُبْتَلُوا بِمَا هُوَ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ 
then they are definitely going to be tested with more than that. So they should not lose hope. When they when they were to be tested, and believers should know that those who are much better than them were tested with much worse. So whenever we're tested, then maybe we should know that our faith gets put to the test and our hearts get put to the test, and we get ta- we get to taste close to hopelessness, and we get to start feeling like the promise won't come true. Relief won't come from Allah. We start holding on to those ideas or start those ideas start casting a shadow on our hearts because maybe Allah Azza wa wants us to s- taste a glimpse of that hopelessness so we can, when we grasp, when we get that hope from Allah and we get the word of Allah coming and giving us relief, that we find that joy in it that we wouldn't have found otherwise. And He wants us to experience this difficulty. So the other is, you know, when they lost hope, there was nothing specified lost hope in what? Right, And so the idea that when Allah's help comes, it will come from places where you couldn't even imagine. It will come from any, any of the doors that Allah might open. So finally, as I close this up, وَلَا يُرَدُّ بَأْسُنَا عَنِ الْقَوْمِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ I already explained this when I was opening up the first uh, uh, interpretation. One thing I skipped was, فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءَ has also been read, فَنُنْجِي مَنْ نَشَاءَ We rescue whoever we want. We rescue whoever we want. And the other reading is Nujiya Man Nasha, which is whoever we want was rescued. So the passive form, whoever we want was rescued, or we rescue whoever we want. Both of those are plausible readings and have been found mutawatira. They're, they're established in our tradition. So based on that, just one comment about uh, rescue from Allah Azza wa Jal and Wala Yuraddu Ba'suna Ali Qawmi al Mujrimin. You know, messengers are outnumbered. Their followers are outnumbered and they're on the verge of being killed most of the time. Right? Things are getting really bad and they're on the verge of being killed. But look at this ayah. Instead of them fearing for themselves, they're losing hope that these people are going to be destroyed. The reality is messengers are actually never really in danger. The reality is the people that deny the messengers are always in danger. That's the reality. And messengers and believers are not going to be the ones that need rescuing. It's the people who didn't believe in them that will wish they had rescue. They're the ones in need of rescue. It's not Musa who needs rescue, it's Fir'aun who needs rescue. You see how Qur'an reverse engineers our thoughts about power and weakness? The one who has Iman is safe, and the one who has Kufr is in need of rescue. The one who has Iman has protection, and al kafirina la mawla lahum, and those who disbelieve have no protector over them whatsoever. Your eyes can deceive you. Your eyes can make you look like the believer has no protection. The disbeliever has all the power. It can look like that. But you will have to, and I will have to decide, will we look at this reality from the lens of the world? Or will we look at this reality from the lens of our iman? Who is actually in trouble? And who is actually in power? <inaudible> you are the supreme if in fact you have true faith. If you're in a real state of faith. You can have the highest palaces in the world, the mightiest military in the world, the mightiest oppressive regimes in the world, but you are weak before Allah. And the one who has nothing is mighty over you and has izzab over you in the sight of Allah. This is the, this is the, the eyesight of a believer, the insight of a believer. وَلَا يُرَدُّ بَأْسُنَا عَنِ الْقَوْمِ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And our war will not be turned away from criminal people. Now a lot of people in social media have commented and asked me to comment on uh, what's going on in France. Uh, among other things previously when incidents like this uh, erupt then I'm asked to make comments about it and I have been I'm very, I've been very disturbed by what's happened um, it's yet another episode of something we've seen over and over and over again I've seen episodes like this about the de- degradation of Allah's messenger of Allah himself of the Quran uh, of Islam of people we consider sacred uh, and I've seen this for since I became conscious of being a Muslim so this is, not, this is not something new, and it's still not something I'm desensitized to. It still burns, it still hurts, it still stabs the same way it does the first time you hear about it. Uh, and I refuse to speak about a subject without having given real thought to it. We're, we're Muslim. And you know what that means? We're people of afala ta'qilun. Why don't you apply your intellect? We think before we speak. 
We don't just speak out of emotion. We, we analyze something and we control our rage and our temper and we respond and we, we, we respond in a way that's pleasing to Allah and, and in line with the legacy of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it really just, as, as deeply sad as it makes me, it makes me really get lost in thought, how do we respond to this? How do we think about this? What are the Muslims supposed to think about this? And we, we can't just keep resorting to weak answers or hot air answers. Enough hot air. You can write, you can make posts in all caps. It doesn't change how the world works. You know? You can make memes. It doesn't... Yeah, and a bunch of people are virtually angry. What does that do? What does that do? We have... and, and I, Inshallah, I will dedicate this week's khutbah to this subject, but we have... Allah has gifted us with the most powerful document that brought about change in human history... He gave it between our hands. He gave us this. What transformed the human mind like nothing ever did in the world's civilizational history, the Qur'an, the word of Allah Himself, light, that's what He gave us. And we don't know how to respond to a situation. If there's anyone who knows how to respond to a situation, it should be us. If there's anyone who should know how to think about something, it should be the people of thought that were told to, taught to think from Allah Himself. It should be those people that should be the most thoughtful of all. But when I look at the way we respond, I just it just evidences to me that we're not we're we're just not understanding what we have. Or maybe I'm not understanding what we have. So it makes me really step back and think, what are we doing? How are we thinking? You know? I, I want to look deep inside myself and really question. Just even my own experience, last 20 years, last 22, 23 years of seeing this over and over again. And trying to wrap my... And I've, seen, I've heard all the responses, all the reactions that we've had. And I want to look at all of them again. Say, so what does Allah want from you and me when something like this happens? And it can't be mostly what we see. It's got to be something deeper than that. So I'm not claiming that I have the answers or that I have the solution to the problems of the Ummah. I do not. But as a student of the Qur'an, it is frustrating that we don't turn to Allah's book as much as we should. That, that does frustrate me. That does make me sad. We're the ones that have shifa'ul lima fi sudur, healing for what lies in the chest. Think about that ayah. Allah gave us what heals what's inside the chest. Is not the chest of a believer hurting when they see something like that? He says his word has healing in it. So I, I, I pray that I'm able to articulate something that really um, reflects at least a glimpse of what Allah has revealed and what His Messenger's legacy represents in this week's khutbah. So I pray that Allah gives me clarity of thought and, and speech in being able to do so. But um, in the meantime, while I'm giving these durus, some people write angry posts like, why aren't you discussing France? Let me tell you something. Unless this place is burning down, I'm going to keep teaching Qur'an. And if this place does burn down, I'll find a parking lot somewhere and teach Qur'an. And it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. So long as Allah has given me ability and opportunity, I will teach Qur'an. Because you know what? These situations will come and go. These matters will come and go. But the word of Allah is here to stay. So I can respond to those things That's fine But I'll never stop doing this If Allah wills And I pray Allah keeps me firm on that, that commitment That I, I want to learn this book And I want to share what it says That's it It's as simple as that you want me, You'd like me to do other things That's cool I'll try But I know what I must do For myself What I feel is my calling And that's this And I'm going to do it So I'm not sorry. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Okay, I gotta run.